Hello and welcome to another edition of In the Trenches Podcast. I'm your host Seth Root and with me as always is my friend and co-host Cal Davenport. And today we have a very special guest. You might know her as Powerline's Woman of Mystery if you want uh, listen to uh, Steve Hayward's own podcast. Um, and we decided to have her on to talk about uh, originalism, uh, judicial jurisprudence, statesmanship, and... Um, also about a little bit about court cases and, and natural law and, and all that. So with that, um, please help us welcome um, Lucretia on our show. Thank you so much, Seth. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. It's really a very timely and, and incredibly important topic because it gets to the heart of what the role of a, the Supreme Court really is in our society. And I have opinions about that, which I may get an opportunity to share beyond what just originalism and as a, a jurisprudential approach actually means and, and what the role of our Supreme Court should be in our society. And like I said, we may get to that, but we'll start with um, just kind of working our way through that and see where it takes us, I think. Yeah, well, I wanted to start before we talk about how a judge should apply the law uh, and talk a little bit about judicial statesmanship. Um, I was talking with a, a uh, with the Richard Brookheiser because he's going to do a uh, episode with us on uh, John Marshall, and I asked him if he thinks there is a judicial statesmanship, and he said he did, but that um, conservatives play too much into that and, and that maybe judges just strictly try and follow the law. Um, I was wanting your take on that. And if one, if there, in, in your opinion, if there is a judicial statesmanship and if so, do it's, it's Richard Burkheiser right in that. Well, uh, so I would answer that if there is a judicial statesmanship, it is uh, personified by Chief Justice John Marshall. I am not sure there are many examples post John Marshall of actual what I would call judicial statesmanship in the sense that the powers of the particular justice of the Supreme Court have been used unqualifiedly for the good of the country. I know that um, that people will say Oliver Wendell Holmes, we'll leave that aside, Other, others, but Chief, Just, Chief Justice John Marshall's in a league of his own. And I think that probably one of the biggest problems with our, our legal studies, with our law schools, with the, the historians who study the court and study the justices, that, that entire beyond law school uh, body of thought is that they misunderstand what Chief, Just, Chief Justice John Marshall really did for us. And that is not that he decided to thrust the Supreme Court into the midst of all of the political uh, controversies of the day. In fact, he did try in many cases when he walked a fine line between for, say the Federalists and the Jeffersonians, which he did often to, to come up with a, a statesmanlike approach via the Constitution. But let me go backwards and, and say what I mean by the misinterpretation of, of Marshall's role. So if we go and start with Marbury versus Madison, remember that what happens there when the Supreme Court declares for itself the power of judicial review, meaning in this case, in the case of Marbury, to overturn an act of Congress, uh, under the theory that the judges say what the law is, the judges say what the constitution is, and if the constitution is somehow violated by a law, then the constitution has to take precedence and deciding that and declaring that is the job of the judiciary. Marshall's very clear about that, but there are things to remember about that particular case. And one of them is, is that the law in question actually had to do with the powers of the judiciary itself. And that goes back to a separation of powers issue. And that is the only time that Marshall ever believed that he should uh, 
lead the court to the place where they would overturn an act of Congress. He was very committed to the separation of powers and understood judicial power in a very, I would say, limited and restricted way in that regard. He saw it as critical and he did many, many things throughout his time on the court, very long amount of time on the court as chief justice to forge and to shape the, the future direction of the Supreme Court and make it in many ways, the important institution it is in our society and to fulfill that idea of the court being a check in the system of checks and balances and the separation of powers. But don't make more of it than what really happened when modern judicial uh, legislators like to say um, that it is, you know, the province of uh, the judiciary to say what the law is the law is the starting place. And when Marshall said, let us never forget it is a constitution we are expounding, he doesn't mean that it should be anything that the judges want it to be. Rather, he means just the opposite. But he's often misused in that way. Do I think that there are very many subsequent justices on the Supreme Court who deserve the title of statesman? I might give that title to Justice John Harlan um, for his dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, that was a statesmanlike dissent. It didn't amount to much, unfortunately, but had it, it might have actually uh, been just an, a, a sea change in the direction that the country went on in terms of racial discrimination and race relations. But beyond that, let me just say one last thing. I know that Chief Justice John Roberts imagines himself as a sort of reincarnation of John Marshall, his constant idea that I, if I just sort of split the baby here, if I just don't come across as a conservative justice appointed by a Republican president, but I take both sides and I try to keep the court out of the worst of the partisan things, then I'm acting like a judicial statesman. And I'll come back we talk about a couple of things a little bit later and expound on that further, but Mar excuse me, Roberts is anything but that. Roberts is, and as every passing decision he's involved in goes by, I like him less and less and what he's doing there less and less because he really doesn't understand, even in today's context, what the court is doing, what a truly nonpartisan Supreme Court should be doing in our society. My, my best example would be perhaps the recent decision when they refused to even take up the Texas case on electoral fraud. Did I believe that that case was likely to, to succeed? It's hard to say. Um, it's maybe not, but uh, the point of the matter was Roberts didn't take the case because he didn't think it was likely to succeed. He didn't convince the Trump appointees to take the case because it was unlikely to succeed. He took the case because what he knew was that if, if the Supreme Court even took the case, it would have given credence to claims that there were electoral fraud. And that cowardly attitude really I, I, I can't even I can't even articulate how much damage that did because and this is something that I, I talk about frequently in my upcoming book, when the court makes a pronouncement, that pronouncement becomes in and of itself self, how should I say this, self-executing almost. So when the court said we're not going to take this case on standing issues, that didn't translate across the country. That particular decision was used over and over and over again as proof that there were no issues that had to be resolved by courts. Trump lost in every single uh, judicial arena. He took a case, that kind of thing. And, and that was a cowardly decision. That was the opposite of judicial statesmanship. The court's refusal to take the subsequent case after the election was decided, I think follows in the same footsteps. Not because I think that we should be looking at overturning the election of uh, 2020, but rather because if the court has any role in our society today, it needs to take on those difficult questions and to do it based upon the constitution. So yes and no is my answer to your just judicial statesman question. Long answer, I apologize. No, no problem. I'm going to let Cal uh, get in in just a second, but 
Um, I am surprised that you didn't mention Clarence Thomas um, being a statesman. Is, is there a reason why or, or um, you know, just no, wondering. if I have a favorite, it's in the in the, the modern court, it's definitely Clarence Thomas. I don't know that there were many of his decisions that I disagree with. I didn't mention him only because I was going to mention him later in a different question you were going to ask me that, but at the same time, I don't know how, how do I say this? I don't know how influential Clarence Thomas has been in the sense that his natural law approach to the constitution that I share, by the way, has really rarely commanded a majority and even in dissent, there are often those supposedly conservative justices who don't join his reasons, his rationale for dissenting, even though they come to the same conclusion. So it's not that I don't believe that he's a great man, that he's probably the best thinker on the court, not just today, but for, you know, for many, many decades back. I just, I don't see him as doing anything other than kind of a rear guard action, preventing things from getting much, much worse. And in, in some cases, maybe that is statesmanship in this case, but um, that's that's kind of my answer to that. I, okay. I want to okay. use that statesmanship label for someone who actually can be said to have a, a definite impact on the future of the country in a positive direction. And I don't know that, Okay. I mean, even thinking about him as, I hate this kind of thing, I'm especially down on it right now because I constantly am being bombarded with Women's History Month and I'm finding that so offensive and patronizing, I can't even tell you. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But Thomas has kind of that same problem, except that he's not even accepted as, uh, you know, only the second African American on the court because he doesn't play the game that they want him to play. He doesn't buy into the left's uh, expectation for what the an African American serving on the court should be. And so for, even from that point of view, he's not as influential as I absolutely believe he should be. I wonder if in the future we'll see okay. Okay. see Justice Thomas as somebody whose dissents are quoted in decisions that maybe begin to go in a different direction than the current court. And I think of Justice Harlan's dissent being utilized in um, more recent decisions, even from, uh, from Plessy. Um, but uh, I think it's also an interest, it, it's an interesting, um, distinction to draw between Justice Thomas and, and Chief Justice Roberts in terms of what what statesmanship might be. I think there's a there's a an instinct among many people to see statesmanship in compromise. Um, and that's where people see it in, in Chief Justice Roberts. And we can look at people who we we did a series on statesmanship and we had Jay Cost on to talk about James Madison. Who is who put together several different compromises, but it's not compromise in itself that makes the statesman. It seems it's um, there. There's more to the context of it than that, and I think there are a lot of people, such as Justice Roberts, who learn the the wrong lesson from people like Madison as a statesman. I I, I think you're absolutely right about that, and and here's an example I would use. Take it back a little bit further to his decision in the um, NFIB versus Sebelius, the Obamacare case. So he has that, that statement where he says, you know, it's not really up to us to, as the court to overturn a stupid law. Uh, he doesn't say it quite that bad. He says, you know, it's up to the uh, American people to turn out their elected representatives in the next election, all of which I absolutely agree with. But there's a little bit too much false modesty in that statement because kind of like what I just gave in his example for um, the, the Texas case, remember what happens as a result of NFIB versus Sebelius. I remember where I was. I was in a hotel on the Stairmaster when the decision came over um, on the news. And, you know, I was, I was just flabbergasted. But 
you know, I'm a, I'm I'm a constitutional scholar, and I read the case, and I understood what he said. But remember what really happened. That was an endorsement by the Supreme Court of Obamacare. It didn't matter what the technical legal issues were there. It was the court saying, yep, Obamacare is constitutional, even though there were, you know, some parts that they decided wasn't, you know, or that the individual mandate was not allowed by the Commerce Clause, but it was a tax, you know, on and on and on. But what happens as a result of that, even in concrete terms, is the next election, in the election of 2010, Democrats, those who voted for Obamacare paid big prices in the election, but in the election of 2012 that followed the um, NFIB versus Sebelius decision, remember that's Obama won big and uh, actually won quite a few more than anybody expected uh, congressional seats and Senate seats. There was an actual practical outcome to that decision where, hey, it's not unconstitutional anymore. It's not even up for grabs. It's not unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said so, so let's move on to other issues. And that, I think, has been the problem with, with Justice Roberts all along, is he can pretend all he wants that the court has taken this position or that position that's a compromise, as you say, or that's a uh, a little bit reticent about getting involved in political controversies. Think about the, the cases having to do with the mandates in California uh, for coronavirus, you know, shutting down churches when uh, uh, other more secular activities weren't subject to the same kinds of restrictions or the Nevada case where churches could have only 50 people, but casinos could have up to 50% capacity. And I know that there are procedural issues involved and that that's why Roberts, blah, blah, this and that. But all that did was remind people that, hey, the Supreme Court didn't stick up for our religious freedom rights. Whatever the legal issues, the procedural issues involved, the United States Supreme Court says, you don't have religious rights if some community health official says it's more important that you stay home than to go to church. That's what came away from that decision. And that's what I have against Chief Justice John Roberts. He needs to understand that. I have a great quote, forgive me for a second. Let me just see if I can pull it up. Maybe I can't, but um, it's basically the idea that the court Sure, they may follow election returns, but what really happens is election returns follow what the court says. And what the court now pronounces is way too important in terms of the effect it has on the public mind. You know, we talk about Lincoln and Lincoln tells us that he who can change public opinion is more important than he says, he who makes laws or even judges. But when the judges are making law with the kind of authority that the Supreme Court now has, they are changing public opinion. You can think about that in the cases involving same-sex marriage. You can think about it in the cases, the recent, um, uh, uh, you said it there, I always forget, probably because my brain tries to, the Bostock case, you know? Um, I'm not saying that the country wasn't moving in the direction of a greater kind of openness to the idea of same-sex marriage or even a more openness to the idea of transgender or uh, sexual preference, that kind of thing. But once the Supreme Court makes a decision, there's no turning back. And everybody seems to follow along with that rather than allowing the real elements of our uh, political system, the, the political elements to make those kinds of decisions based upon what the community is demanding. I don't think law should remain static. I just don't think that the Supreme Court should be changing it and they don't realize the power they have when they do. Yeah, there's there um, even, especially in, in today's day when information is just so readily available, any major decision the Supreme Court makes makes it to the general public, which generally doesn't have an appreciation for the nuance of procedures and things like that. And I think you're you're right. If there's a statesmanship angle to this, uh, it's that the court needs to be conscious of what will be they will per be perceived to be doing, regardless of what they are technically doing. 
Um, to move on to the, the second question, can you, um, to, just to kind of get into originalism in general, can you give us a broad definition? And I think you sort of um, included elements in it at, at the beginning of our discussion. And then can you talk a little bit about different camps that it might break down into and what distinguishes those? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Let me just start with just a tiny little bit of history so that we can place the idea of an originalist jurisprudence in context. So when we talk about the court moving on after Chief Justice Marshall, what we see is a pretty steady progress of the Supreme Court becoming more and more involved in what we might call political controversies, where the Supreme Court is becoming more likely to substitute its own political, partisan, ideological, or even constitutional biases for what the Constitution itself says. Let me jump ahead and just give examples of where that ends up in, say, the Warren era, where you have Chief Justice Earl Warren in the Warren Court deciding cases based upon really no reference whatsoever to the Constitution. Let me give you an example. One person, one vote. There's nothing in the Constitution, nothing, zero, less than nothing, actually, that would actually provide any kind of justification or rationale for the court to come out and say that legislative district, districts in states have to be organized or have to be apportioned according to some one person, one vote principle. We know that, why? Because our own Senate isn't set up that way. We know that even because our own House of Representatives at the federal level isn't set up that way because every state, regardless of their population gets at least one representative. So a terrible decision. And I mean, serious consequences because of that. We look at the, the Warren Court's decisions with respect to things like criminal justice reform, the Miranda rule. So maybe the Miranda rule, you know, everybody knows what that is. You have the right to remain silent, blah, blah, blah. If you don't read and uh, suspect these rights and make sure they understand them, then anything they say can't, can't be used against them in court, so on. Maybe not a bad criminal procedure, but that's not Congress deciding that throughout the whole entire United States, local, state, and federal, that every law enforcement officer has to read a suspect his or her rights before taking them into custody. That was the Supreme Court making that up out of whole cloth. And so you have all of these de decisions, uh, even getting into the Griswold decision about the right to privacy with respect to contraception, the Roe versus Wade. So the backlash to that is, as the court continues to make up things that aren't in the Constitution, which they think will advance a certain political or partisan agenda, the backlash to that is, well, first was strict constructionism. That was the term that uh, Richard Nixon, who inherited a society, really, where crime was definitely on the rise. And in many cases, it was believed that crime was on the rise because of all of these criminal justice reforms that had been implemented by the Supreme Court, uh, making it easier for criminals, more difficult for law enforcement. So anyway, so so Richard Nixon says he's going to appoint justices that, that adhere to strict construction of the Constitution. And whatever, I, I don't even know that we can get into exactly what that means and how well that works. But it, a follow on from that was a little bit more nuanced idea that what really matters is that a, a judge, when interpreting the Constitution or even laws, should look at the original intent of the person the, 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 excuse me, the legislature, the legislators who framed the law. Why? Because that's where the whole idea of democratic theory comes into play. The law was passed according to the provisions of our constitution that represented the different groups in our society, the, 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 you know, the whole idea that the people make laws through their representatives. That's what makes a law part of democratic theory, if the judges can just make it up themselves, then of course that's exceedingly problematic. The constitution itself has a sort of exalted place in all of that because not only is it law made by 
duly elected representatives, but it's it's super law, we might call it. It's it's organic or fundamental law because it takes a super majority to, to pass a law like that. That's why the constitution takes precedence. So original intent began with this idea, if we could just figure out what the framers of the constitution of say the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, the reconstruction amendments, the bill of rights, what have you, what they intended and use that as our guide for how to interpret a law today, then we will be true to the constitution. We will restrain this notion of judicial activism where judges make laws instead of interpret laws. And so that began, I, I guess, probably fair to say, maybe the, the late 70s, early 80s. And then you had a sort of secondary idea come into play. And that is that the intent of the framers is a very hard thing to understand. How do you climb into the mind of a James Madison or um, you know a Bingham from the 14th Amendment ratification debates or that kind of thing? How do you know what it was they really intended? Can you look at the legislative history? Well, that doesn't necessarily tell you all that much. There's a just really terrible part of uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision where Justice Earl Warren pretends to look at the legislative history of the 14th Amendment. He says, you know, the, these people said this, but the losers said that. Well, so who cares what the loser said? So, I mean, even applying this idea of legislative intent um, is a very difficult thing. You can look at the debates on ratification of the constitution or amendments, and it gives you some ideas, but you can't really crawl into the mind of a legislator and know what they wanted. So then that kind of morphed into what we call um, original public meaning. So originalism now, the, the originalism practiced, I believe, by uh, Justice Antonin Scalia and followed on um, by his student, uh, Amy, Coney, Amy Coney Barrett, is this idea that we should just look at, lang at the language of the constitution, language of the amendments. What was the, what did the reasonable person at the time understand that this word to mean? What's the context? Can't just take it out of context. And so try to be a reasonable, rational person looking at the actual text of the constitution, sometimes known also as textualism and use that again as that limiting idea on judicial power. How do you bring back judges to deciding cases, not on the basis of their own personal whims or political biases, but on what the constitution actually says? Because if they don't, we no longer have a constitutional republic. I mean, it's really that simple. If, if our laws are made and decided by a bunch of, I shouldn't even say a bunch, five unelected uh, serving for life, old men and old women, we don't have a constitutional republic if they are protecting our rights, if they are protecting the constitution, that's a different story. And, that, and originalism in all of its different forms is that attempt to force judges to look at the constitution, the text of the constitution, the intent of the constitution and bring us to a place where that's what defines us, not whatever group of judges happen to be there at any given time and what their political biases are. If, now, uh, you, there's some others, but that's th those are the basic uh, originalism. I mean, there's what they call common good originalism, and uh, eh, I'll come back to what my problem with all of that is momentarily. But I wanted to at least answer your question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, you know that this is a great follow up question because you know um, you talked about textualism, and and we want to zero in and uh, on that because. Um, I think a lot of people mistake it for originalism. Um, and you, I mean, I, I mean, look at the Bostock case. I think that was um, a, a case where um, I think as, as uh, Justice, uh, um, not, not, not Clarence Thomas, but uh, Alito, um, Alito kind of said, you know, the, th this, um, this isn't really originalism here. Um, and, and so anyway, we, we wanted to talk to you about textualism and why, uh, it might oppose real originalism, I guess, and, and kind of, if you could, help the listeners with uh, kind of Fox originalism and, and, and real originalism. So so the problem with your, your 
example is a very good one. The problem with it is it illustrates the problem with textualism, I guess you could say. So if you talk about the Bostock case and really quickly for your listeners, the Bostock case was decided by a Trump appointee, Neil Gorsuch. He wrote the, the majority opinion in that case. And the case had to do with several different um, complaints that, that came to the court by, I believe if I'm not mistaken, in two cases, it was, um, in one case, it was a transgender person who claimed to have been fired when uh, coming out as transgender. In the other case, uh, it was a person who came out as gay and said, when I come back, uh, you know, anyway. And so it went to the Supreme Court and the question was, can you, does the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, Title VII, which forbids discrimination in employment on the basis of sex, race, sex, color, creed, all these things, does, does it apply to persons who are discriminated against, in this case fired, on the basis of their sexual orientation? We use that term right now, gender identity, I guess would be the other term. And of course, from a textualism point of view, there's absolutely no indication whatsoever that the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 intended that outcome. This isn't a commentary on whether or not it ought to be the case that uh, people are discriminated against by their employers for their sexual identity or their sexual orientation. It's whether or not the law actually intended to cover that. And Gorsuch's opinion is about as terrible as it gets from that point of view. He wants to say that the text of the language, when it talks about sex, that sex means, textually speaking, sex means all sorts of things having to do with sex, like sexual orientation and sexual identity and those sorts of things. And, and he has all these, I can't even Re repeat them. I, I have a hard time repeating stupid arguments, but um, he uses all of these different ways of trying to show that this is what the text actually meant, when of course just the opposite is true. And Congress has many, many times over been asked to include sexual orientation and gender identity and has declined to do so, you know, to amend itself the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So textualism really is... <sighs> Scalia believed he was practicing textualism or, and it was more or less the same thing as originalism. I think that what we're at a point right now is that Gorsuch has just messed this up so badly that the, the term is meaningless because textualism would mean, what does this word mean? The way it was meant when the law was passed. Why is that important? Again, because that's the democratic process. Laws not only need to be passed through the appropriate democratic process for doing so, but they also need to be known. Why do we continue even to, to follow bad laws until they're changed? Because the uh, it's very necessary to have the stability of knowing what the law is until it's changed. And that's another problem with the Supreme Court. If I could go back for just a moment changing their mind all the time about what the law is supposed to be. It's supposed to be stable. And it was stable, except in Gorsuch's opinion, no, the text really meant that back in 1964 when it was passed. It just makes no sense. It it's also seems to be a, a textualism and the way um, uh, Neil Gorsuch talks, uh, you know, uh, adjudicates the law. Um, it's it's really like an historicist argument, you know, to 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 just look back. It seems like to me, and and say what did they think during this time and this sort of place, and um, I can see why someone like Harry Jaffa would have a field day with something like this sort of thinking because it is a, a historicist argument, no. I, yes, I see that. That's a good way to put it. Um, I, I don't know. You, Last week in our podcast, Steve talked about the arrogance of uh, of historicism that you know progress is is by definition better, and that's a, when you when you frame it that way, it makes a lot of sense that 
our understanding cannot really be limited by the actual historical circumstances under which that text was written, but it needs to be informed by our much more superior position, our understanding that we have today. Now, I will want to quote for just a moment Alito here um, when he talks about how Gorsuch determined that not only did sex in the, the, the term sex in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act mean sexual orientation and gender identity, but it should not be interpreted any other way. Because as you say, in a kind of historicist view, that's what we understand sex to mean today, and that's what it must mean. And Alito follows on that by saying, the, arg the arrogance of this argument is breathtaking. Uh, you know, and it really is. Kavanaugh puts a funny little um, label on what he thinks Gorsuch does and calls it living literalism. <laughs> so we're, later on, I believe we're slated to talk about living constitutionalism, but living literalism is a whole new concept where we're going to say this is exactly what the text says and what it means, but it's going to be based upon our current understanding of of that text, not on what the text meant at the time that it was drafted. So yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, Seth, but I'm going to now. You've alluded to this a little bit, I think, in, in some of your responses so far, but just to put a fine point on it, what is the case for applying originalist thinking to constitutional questions? I did allude to it. I'll just say it quickly and, and you know, make sure that it's uh, really concrete. And that is that we're constantly looking for ways to rein in the court's power throughout our society, but especially at the level of the Supreme Court, because what we're finding is unelected judges are making our laws. And they're not just making our laws, they're setting they're redefining the public mind, if we might want to put it in Lincolnian terms. They are changing public opinion so that laws inevitably follow the direction that the court is trying to take us. And one of the reasons I think that that became so successful is, you know, this is often the case, it, it was a good reason. Brown versus Board of Education went a long ways toward helping the entire civil rights movement move forward. Um, culminating, of course, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the idea that that courts can, in fact, change public opinion has, as a result of that and a few other cases, actually gained its own level of acceptance. But if you think about it for even a moment, you realize that makes no sense. If the Supreme Court makes a decision rightly based upon the Constitution and that changes public attitudes and public opinions and that in turn changes legislation because the Congress or the state legislatures follow that change in public opinion, then that's exactly what ought to happen. However, when the courts make those kinds of decisions that change the public mind based upon their own partisan biases, we've got a real problem. And so originalism, again, was just this simple way of saying, wow, what do we do about that? How do we ground judicial power back in the Constitution? How do we return ourselves to a democratic republic and not a society ruled by this, you know, this tribunal that is unelected and, and, and accountable only in the in tiny sense that the nomination confirmation process for, for judges and justices has built into it kind of a representative character. And of course, by that, what I mean is the president appoints and uh, the Senate confirms and both of those of a sets of officials are elected. And to the extent that people vote for either president or their senator based upon their opinions about the court, then we can say that there's a certain amount of uh, represent representative character of the Supreme Court, but you know that's very attenuated. That attenuation was purposeful when the court was not deciding political controversies, when the court was there to decide adversarial cases. It made a lot of sense to have a Supreme Court completely outside of a political 
a representative electoral process, but when the court is the most important arbiter of our political controversies today, we see that the system for choosing justices just doesn't work anymore. Think about the Kavanaugh hearings. I mean, think about how god awful the behavior of the left was in the Kavanaugh hearings. And I mean, it was it, it's so despicable, but but so much was at stake in their opinion with that Supreme Court appointment you can't in some ways blame them for bringing out you know, every possible weapon they had against allowing Kavanaugh to be confirmed. Same goes for the Amy Coney Barrett uh, nomination. They just didn't have as many weapons to bring to bear that time around. And so ugh, originalism is a, in my opinion, faulty way of trying to get the court back on track, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, to follow up even on your uh, your Kavanaugh and uh, and Barrett examples, we can even throw the shoe on the other foot, and um, it and I think this shows the the left's um, complete lack of self awareness on this. Um, you can make the same argument potentially about might, the merits might be different, but about Merrick Garland as well. That this that the question of who holds the court is now a central question. Uh, it's, it's an existential question to many people. And um, how many people was that? That was their main reason for voting for Trump, mm -hmm. um, that he would get to decide who the Supreme Court, who was, were members of the Supreme Court or um, who federal judges were. So if, if we want to take the importance, sort of take the air out of these controversial questions, it seems that there's no better way to do it than to restrict the power that these institutions have to make these decisions. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. But but I don't know that originalism, how do I say this? I don't know that it is a adequate to the task. And if you'll forgive me, I'm just gonna kind of jump ahead to the question that you're, you are going to ask me anyway. The reason I don't believe that it is adequate to the task is because the constitution and itself and the text of the constitution itself is ambiguous. Let me give a, a first a simple example and then I'm gonna give, if, if you'll allow me a little bit more complicated example. The simple example, I think that we could look at, um, oh, I'm gonna, uh, Olmstead versus United States. That was a case uh, 1928 at the beginning of the sort of electric electronic revolution, the uh, really quickly without going into the details, a wiretap was placed on Olmstead's uh, telephone lines. Uh, he was involved in some shady stuff and there was no warrant because, you know, there was no law saying that there had to be a warrant if you were going to tap into someone's telephone lines. It was just new technology. And it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court determined, yeah, there's no Fourth Amendment violation here because uh, at the time of the passage, the ratification of the, for, of the Fourth Amendment, they didn't have telephones. And, you know, it's a little bit more specific than that. But basically, that was their point. And so there's a perfectly good originalist textualism reading of the Fourth Amendment in the Olmstead case. But of course, the real point of the matter is that if we look at the Fourth Amendment and what the Fourth Amendment is designed to do, we see a natural law principle there. We see the principle that whatever else our constitution does based upon why it did that, and that is the principles of the Declaration, that um, we have a government designed to secure our rights, and that's its purpose. So securing our rights leads us to understanding certain civil rights that are necessary in order to secure those natural rights. And one of those is a kind of freedom, a sphere of privacy that individuals have, an, a sp sphere of autonomy and privacy into which government may not intrude. If you take it from that point of view, then of course you see that something like a wiretap on a telephone line to talk about ancient technology now is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And the court did change its mind, that's true enough. 
But let me give a better example of that. And this goes back to my teacher, Harry Jaffa, who, who made this argument much better than I will ever be able to make it, but I'll, I'll try my best. And that is that Dred Scott, which is usually touted by people like Scalia and other originalists as a perfect example of judicial usurpation of legislative power, wherein the court decided in Dred Scott that Dred Scott had no standing to sue. Dred Scott was a slave who had been taken by his master into a free territory, made free by a congressional act. And he said, because I've been taken to live in a free territory, I'm a free person, I'm no longer a slave. He sued in federal courts and it made it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you are not free. Well, no, in fact, it's worse than that. You don't have any right to sue in federal court because you're not a federal citizen. Why are you not a federal citizen? Because you are a member of the African race and as such, you have no rights, which the white man is bound to respect and you can justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for your own benefit. And Tani goes, sorry, Chief Justice Tani, who wrote the opinion in that case, looks at all this history and uh, looks at what supposedly the original intent of the framers was and says, look, if they really intended for um, slaves to be considered uh, eventually capable of being citizens or even blacks being capable of being citizens, they wouldn't have done X, Y, and Z. Don't have time to go into all the details of it, but basically what he says is if they had really meant that blacks should enjoy all of the same rights and privileges of citizens of the United States, they wouldn't have done what they did. And he's absolutely right about that in certain terms, but it if, if you, I mean, there's nothing in the Constitution that on the face of it necessarily disagrees with Tawny's opinion in the Dred Scott case. The only way that we understand that Tawny's opinion is wrong is by reference to the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence tells us what a person is. And the Declaration of Independence tells us why we have rights, that all persons are equal. Because of that, they have natural rights. The Constitution refers to persons when it refers to slaves. And that's important because what Tawny tries to say is that slavery is just, you know, uh, it's just another kind of property. But if you don't have reference to the Declaration of Independence, the natural law principles of the Declaration of Independence informing your reading of the Constitution, you can look at things like the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Fugitive Slave Law and the um, the, the ban on the, the extension of the ban on the importation of slaves, the protections given to slavery in the constitution and say, yeah, it was a pro-slavery document. You only understand that it wasn't that by reference to the constitution. That's a, a, a more difficult example and I'm not doing it justice here, but there are principles that we only can understand when informed by natural law. Let me go back to the subject of the right to privacy really quickly and see if that makes it a little bit easier to understand. I do believe that whatever else the constitution does, it believes that citizens have a sphere of privacy into which government may not intrude. Why? Because we didn't give it up to the government. The government has only those powers we surrendered to it. What does the court do, however? The court tells us what they think privacy is and isn't, right? They tell us what they think should fall. And at one time, it's the right for married couples to get information about contraception. Then it's the right to have an abortion. Then it's the not the right to engage um, in homosexual activity, but then they change their mind and then it is. And that's not a natural law understanding of the constitution. That's not understanding the principles of the constitution. Maybe it's originalism, if you see originalism as sort of whatever you want it to be, but it's, it's not understanding the constitution based upon its natural law principles, which are very, very simple and straightforward in many cases. We created this government for one purpose, and that was to secure rights that government didn't give us that we possess because we're human beings. If the court could just look at what's in the constitution from that point of view, they wouldn't make the stupid decisions they do about religious freedom. They wouldn't make the stupid decisions that they do about race relations and discrimination. 
it 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 seems so simple to me, um, but you know that's because I studied with Harry Jaffa. <laughs> I don't understand why they get into these sort of posit positivistic ways of interpreting the Constitution, even when they're supposedly originalists and conservatives. Um, and that's a whole other subject we could get on, but I talked too long, so I'll stop. I'm going to let Cal jump in in just a second, but um, I'm going to I, I want to uh, I'm going to push back, quote unquote, even I mean, I agree with you and everything, but the standard um, uh, point I think many people like Scalia and Bork make is um, isn't Jaffa's view of natural rights, natural law, the declaration, uh, all that seems like judicial activism. And um, what what do you say to 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 those people in response? Well, even Steve argues that against me often, for what it's worth, Steve Hayward, um, saying that, you know, any kind of natural law approach to the Constitution just opens up, uh, you know, the the whole uh, Lochner era and the progressives and so on who claim to be to claim to be, you know, imposing their version of natural law. If you aren't grounded in the constitution, but you're grounded in these philosophical principles, then, you know, you've le left the door open for judicial activism and so on. I think there's an easy answer to that. We, it's not that hard to understand the really basic principles of the Declaration of Independence, in my opinion. And it's not that hard to apply them as James Madison did. It's not that hard to look at how James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers were completely informed by those principles in, in the kinds of things that they did. Uh, the in Jefferson's case, the statute for religious freedom, in the case of the others, you know, founding the constitution. How, it's, it's not that difficult. It really isn't. If you ha begin with a basic understanding that all human beings are created equal, that that equality is an empirical fact. It can be seen in nature, it can be understood as a very real reflection of, call it Christianity, that every person is equal in the sight of God. You can choose one or the other reason in that case supports revelation, in my opinion, and vice versa. But that leads us to certain basic principles. What you can't do is say that progressivism in its desire to remake society uh, according to some kind of utopian future understands anything about natural law. That's not natural law. That's in fact the opposite. It's the complete negation of natural law by believing that human beings don't have a nature and they don't have rights that need to be protected. And so I don't see the problem with it. I really don't. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's tough because it's tough to argue against people on your own side in many cases where you share the same goals and the same outcomes, but it does sometimes matter how you get there. And originalism in my point, in my view, doesn't get you far enough because the constitution as a text is, you said it, I think, I, I forget if it was Cal or South who said it at the beginning, it's a, I think it was Cal, a series of compromises. Those compromises though only make sense when you understand the natural law principles that, that gave birth to those compromises and made them necessary, right? Why, why compromise with the South on the subject of slavery at all if in fact, you don't believe that slavery is somehow a necessary evil that has to be considered in the making of the constitution for all the reasons we don't have time to talk about. I, I guess I don't see why it's that difficult, but I tend to be awfully simplistic about these things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a sophisticated intellectual. I think that, you know, uh, there, there's lots of places where of course, disagreement's gonna, going to occur, but if we're arguing on the basis of a shared understanding, which of course we don't have anymore, um, thanks to the progressives in my opinion, but if you argue from a basis of a shared understanding, you go back to the kinds of polarizing debates that they had say in the 18, 1820s, uh, you know, the, the debates between the, or the 1810s, the debates between the Federalists and the Jeffersonians or the Democratic Republicans who are trying to understand what, how the Constitution should be interpreted. Today, 
we're just trying to understand how the constitution should be interpreted versus the other side who just wants the constitution to be useful whenever it's useful for their purposes. I, I think it's easier than, than the, that whole school wants to make it out to be. And maybe I'm wrong. So well, I, I think you're right, by, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm totally side with you over Steve any day about the judicial <laughs> activism. Don't so. tell Steve that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Cal. So I wanted to move to, um, to the common law tradition and ask, was, is, should there be a way in which the common law tradition is utilized in interpreting uh, the Constitution? Well, let's begin by understanding that our Constitution was built, um, I, I shouldn't say it wasn't built on a framework of common law, but that was the inheritance of our founders. And, and the common law tradition of, of Great Britain was, of course, up until that time, really one of the greatest inventions of human institutions that the world had ever seen. You know, it did bring about a level of freedom and uh, order and, and, you know, good society, I guess we could say, that had never been seen before in the history of the world. So, you know, th th there's really no question about that. And I do believe that our constitution from that point of view was created by founders who understood the importance of that common law tradition. And there are elements really, I think, in our constitution. Here's, here's an example I would give. We, we tend toward that idea that um, a person is innocent until proven guilty. Why? That's a common law tradition. That is not stated anywhere in our constitution. So there's that element to it. But what we really mean in, in the modern context, when we talk about the common law tradition, we're talking about precedent and, and how what the Supreme Court or other courts um, determine in a particular case applied to a particular controversy with particular facts, they, they come out with a ruling, that ruling in and of itself becomes a precedent that then determines what future cases or how future cases will be decided. That's, that's kind of what we mean by the common law tradition. And it is a part of our uh, jurisprudence in the United States across all levels. However, <sighs> when you juxtapose the common law tradition with originalism, what do you get? Uh, it's, it, it can be, they're, they're not the same thing, that's for sure. The originalism does in fact, harken back to the constitution, whereas the, the concept of stare decisis, let the decision stand, adhering to precedent, really takes you into the arena of judge-made law. We can thank Oliver Wendell Holmes for that, I think, because whatever common law tradition there was before um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he definitely turned it into what we'd call judge-made law and, and advocated for it to be exactly that. And that, I think, is the problem we have today. We're, we're, we've inherited that situation where somehow precedent becomes more important than because it, of course, is central to the court's continuance in power than the Constitution itself. And, and really the best example of that that all your listeners, I'm sure, are going to understand is, is Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade has simply zero, absolutely zero, less than zero basis in the Constitution. Even persons who, constitutional scholars who are, um, you might call them left wing, who are very uh, big supporters of the right to abortion, their pro-choice will tell you that Roe versus Wade is just one of the worst, most god awful pre pretenses at constitutional interpretation that the court has ever done. How is that still a precedent? How are we still today talking about, oh, well, we can't have a judge who would even consider overruling Roe versus Wade? And these are conservatives as well. Look, you know, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, none of them came out and said, of course, Roe versus Wade is terrible law. They all said it's the precedent and we will follow it, right? What is that? That's stupid. If you have a bad decision that's not based on the Constitution, precedent shouldn't matter. But of course it does. And it does because it's controversial to overturn a precedent like Roe versus Wade, and you'd never get through the nomination process, but also because 
even conservatives, strict constructionists, originalists understand that if the court willy-nilly starts changing its own precedents, it loses its own power. It loses its own status within our political system. And I don't know if that really answered your question. Can, can, can I ask this question along the same lines of this common, um, uh, common law kind of tradition? Because... I think the, the you you mentioned earlier a little bit about um, common good originalism, and it seems like um, our friend of the show Josh Hammer um, talks a little bit about this common good originalism and how it's um, uh, uh, in part in line with this common uh, common law tradition, um, and he seems to try and bring back this Anglo American. Um, uh, tradition, so to speak. So, um, it, it seems, and it seems like it's related to this common law tradition. So, can you talk a little bit about that and and how that relates? I think again, it's a little bit like trying to rein in the court, rein in judicial activism, rein in. That's not, that's not an adequate term because. Again, my view of, of the court's power isn't so much its bad decisions as it is <laughs> that those decisions then change the public mind. And the problem with common law originalism or common good originalism is that it still wants to, to play the game the way the court has played it and then try to uh, change the rules a little bit to get the court going more along the lines that they ought to go. I So let me tell you a funny story. I was um, at a conference and um, Professor Harvey Mansfield uh, was there and we happened to be in the bar together, sitting together talking. And I asked him a question. I said, okay, uh, Professor Mansfield, give me one example of one Supreme Court case that has been so salutary for the United States of America that it justifies the Supreme Court. And he looked at me like I was nuts for a minute and then thought about it and started to say, and then he said, no, not. And I said, you know, maybe we could say that Citizens United, but that's already assuming a whole lot of things about the court's role in society. I don't know that you can come up with one. I don't know that you can tell me that the, there has been enough or even any good by the court, at least not since the days of Marshall, that outweighs the incredible amount of harm they have done to our society. I'm thinking about uh, the Supreme Court in the New Deal era, uh, sanctioning uh, progressivism as a you know national policy. Uh, the, the, the direction our national government would go, allowing the growth of the administrative state, which is, I think, one of the most dangerous elements of our current system. All of the things that the court did, from Dred Scott, through Plessy versus Ferguson, through all of those bad decisions during the New Deal era, to the bad affirmative action decisions, to the bad religious uh, freedom decisions, I, I just even one Supreme Court case that has, that would be worth all of the horrible harm that the Supreme Court has done to our society. And that I know is a very, very extreme position, but I will tell you that Professor Mansfield could not give me an example of a case that he thought, as I framed the question, was worth having a Supreme Court for. And that would be my answer. It's not that I'm against those attempts to try and rein in the court and, and sort of ground them in some kind of constitutionally focused public good, common good, you know, good for the society kind of role. It's that the court is just a... a it, as an institution, it's a disaster, in my opinion. And we turn way too often to the court for answers to questions that we, the people, should be answering. Why should I listen to Roberts about whether or not I can go to church? 
answer me that question. I have a constitution that guarantees that I have religious freedom. It's in the First Amendment. Why should I care what Robert says about public health officials knowing better than, and they, you know, they can't really second guess them? That doesn't make any sense to me that we should even ask the Supreme Court. Why should we? be in a position where we ask the Supreme Court if it's okay if we have a prayer at the beginning of a high school commencement. It's none of their business. <laughs> we the people know that that's guaranteed in the Constitution. I, so that's that's my problem with all of those judicial jurisprudential approaches is that they they play the game as it's already been played and just try to uh, switch the rules a little at the margins, if that makes sense. I know it's a very radical position, but that's just how I think about it. And, and it's probably a very impractical position because what, what do you do exactly if you believe that the Supreme Court is a horrible institution and is ruining our society? What do you do about that? I don't know. Those practical things like originalism, original intent, original public meaning, and so on, common good, originalism, they're probably good things to try and do because you're not going to abolish the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I can, I, I see that. Um, just, just the last question, you know, we, we talked a lot about originalism and um, I'm, I'm going to kind of use Charles Kessler's sort of new book about the crisis of two constitutions. I'm sure you have at least uh, heard a lot about that. And he kind of talked about there's this one sort of way and and, and, and it kind of ties to originalism in that it seems like they're trying to conserve the founding, so to speak, or at least try to. Um, and then there's this other constitution and, it, and it's based on um, living constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. And, and so I wanted you to talk to us about the, you know, this living constitutionalism and why, why we should, uh, combat it. Um, well, because it, I think it is still the ascendant, um, theory as, in, in the court. As do I. And it goes back to what you said earlier, Seth, about historicism. It goes back to the progressive assault on our constitutional system, where even just thinking about Woodrow Wilson, who says, you know, we shouldn't be looking at the Constitution as one of those, uh, uh, what does he call it, an aviary, where or, we shouldn't be thinking of it in Newtonian terms, let me put it that way, where pieces are set against each other, you know, the checks and balances, the separation of powers, we should instead of thinking of it as that kind of machine, we should think of it as a living organism that changes, that it grows, that it, that it evolves. And the reason that he did that was because he believed that unlike our framers, that we could in fact reach some kind of utopia through this idea of human perfection, that someday we would be at a place where human beings uh, would live in a perfect society. And all we really needed along the way was a government who could help us get there. And what would that government look like? Well, checks and balances, separation of powers, political branches of government, oh, the, you know, that's just messy. And that, 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 that prevents us from getting things done. You know, today we call it gridlock. And so Woodrow Wilson was never on the court, of course, but the other progressives understood that the way that you get around those strictures of the Constitution is to change the meaning so that it suits you now and today. It, so that what we understand about things like <sighs> the delegation of legislative powers, which at one time was understood to be something that only could go to Congress because the powers belong to the people and the people could only delegate them to Congress. Now, of course, we know, thanks to the court, that those can all be turned over to administrative agencies. And those administrators, of course, they're not the Madisonian those people that Madison warned us about in Federalist 51, you know, remember what he says there, we wouldn't need government if men were angels, and we wouldn't need checks on government if angels were to govern men. Well, the whole point of the progressives is they say, yeah, they really are. They're not angels, but, you know, they're experts, and they're not, 
partisans. They're not pushing a partisan point of view. They're experts in what they do. They're administering things. They're not ruling really. They're not partisans again. And so what they do is of course, always going to be for the good of everyone. And why would we want a constitution that stops that from happening? Why would we want a constitution that has checks and balances on the power of government to accomplish all these wonderful, great things that we want it to do? You hear people talk like that all the time. And so the court's role in all of that is to make sure that in fact, yeah, the constitution is not a roadblock to the progressive ideal of our perfect society when we're going to get there. And, you know, that starts back, of course, with Oliver Wendell Holmes and other progressive um, justices on the courts. Today, of course, it is, I, I agree with you, Seth, the ascendant way of looking at it. Why should we be tied to what a bunch of old white rich men who owned property said in 1787? They weren't concerned about um women of color and uh you know on and on and all the identity groups we want to throw out there that they in fact they they discriminated they they put those people down they you know and, and on and on and so we have to dismiss all that that constitution doesn't deserve our respect it has nothing to teach us in 2021 therefore well, it's a little bit difficult to take the Article 5 route, which would mean, you know, actually amending it to whatever changes need to be made to uh, adapt to modern society. We don't want to do that. It's much easier to just have the courts do that for us. And they do that through the concept of the living constitution. What it meant then is not what it should mean today. So we'll decide what it should mean today. And that's why, back to your earlier question, originalism originalism was was and still is considered an important kind of way of fighting that notion at least if you can be grounded in the constitution and the of, and the text of the constitution itself maybe you can stop that idea that the constitution is anything the judges want it to mean and um, does that answer your question yes yes i i think it does um uh if if you guys all want to know more about this, I really suggest you. I mean, for uh, the the stuff that that I read and informed my thinking, of course, is Harry Jaffa's Storm of the Constitution, um, Hadley Arcus' great book about first things. Um, those two are, are really great. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, I, I like Richard Burkheiser's John Marshall, at least it, it, it delves into the statesmanship of John Marshall and how he thought about things. Um, those, those are probably three books maybe our listeners can, can read. Um, is there any, uh, books you recommend, um, uh, so, Lucretia? So I, I happen to think that Marshall's life in and of itself is just so fascinating. So I would definitely re recommend Brookheiser's book. I actually recommend it's probably not quite as solid in certain places as Brookheiser's book, but um, Jean Edward Smith also wrote a biography, oh, 1996, I think it was, um, John Marshall, Definer of a Nation. And I will tell you, uh, at least for, for geeks like us, it reads like a novel. You won't be able to put it down. Um, and you learn a lot about Marshall's understanding of what the proper role of the court was. I think uh, Brookheiser, I think, does that. His, his is a little bit less of a personal account in some ways, um, but both of them are make for great reading. You know, any book by Jaffa, of course, to me is, is worthwhile. There's another book out by friends of mine on Jaffa, came out recently by, um, I'm not going to remember the title of it. I apologize. I'm just terrible with any of those kinds of things these days, but it's by Ed Erler and, and Ken Masugi, and they have compiled some of Jaffa's previously un- published writings, uh, some of his back and forth with people, which as if you know anything about Harry Jaffa, that's one of the things that he was, in my opinion, wonderful at. You can tell where I get some of my uh, feisty, controversial nature. Uh, I learned a lot of that from Jaffa. Um, so I enjoy that sort of thing, but it's a really interesting look into the whole question of religious freedom and how that helped define um, the founders' understanding of our natural rights and how our, our society should be governed. So if I could remember the name of it, I'd tell you, but it's Ed Erler, 
Edward Erler and, and Ken Masugi. Uh, have you read that book? I, I recommend it to both I, you guys. Um, I haven't yet. I mean, if, if that book, um, which I'm trying to pull up right now, I don't have it. Um, um, but that, yeah, um, that, that book, um, it's a little expensive for, and for a young, um, you know, <laughs> oh. uh, undergrad like me, um, I, 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 I try to, um, you know, spend my money wisely. I and, get um, it. I get it. And, and the know, title of it is the rediscovery of America. There it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, um, um, definitely people should put it on on the list um also glenn elmer's book i think it's the upcoming book that he um is publishing i think in september of this year I'm, i have no doubt he will touch on on it too um but uh, cal is there any any um other books you recommend i think you covered it all right well I, lucretia it's been fun uh, i hope you come back on um uh and and please give uh steve hayward our regards uh he's really a good friend of the show so um thank you so much and thank you so much for having me i really had fun um i i do hope to do it again someday thank you very much well thank you well signing up from in the trenches we'll see you next time mm-hmm.